Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Moving Beyond SQL, Delivering Personalized Responsive Experiences That Customers Crave, sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Tyler Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Tyler is the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Couchbase, where he works closely with a broad group of teams across the organization to bring new products to the market. He focuses on empowering customers by creating awareness and understanding of Couchbase's latest innovative capabilities and how Couchbase technology fits into the overall enterprise database market. Tyler's background is in big data and SQL analytics. He previously worked on worked as an engine, engineering director with Actian's R&D group for Ingress and as Executive Director for Open Source Geospatial Technology at OSGEO. I can speak today. <laughs> Tyler, awesome. hello and welcome. Yeah, you went with the long bio, I guess. Yeah, that's great. I did. That's the, <laughs> the tongue twister. Not the elevator pitch one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, thanks for having me, uh, Shannon. This is great. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's joined and joined on time. This is great. I uh, really wish we could have more of a conversation, maybe at an event sometime. We can sit down and talk through some of the items we're going to touch on today. Um, but I wanted to, to bring uh, the kind of the core foundational principles that really have driven us forward as a company um, as we respond to customer needs and demands in the marketplace. So I want to share some of that kind of perspective with you today. And with that, um, I'll start off the uh, presentation by changing the title. Um, let me just click on the right screen here. Um, I, I really should have actually called this Beyond uh, Relational because as you'll see, we actually still have, um, we still enjoy the benefits of SQL-like query languages within uh, Couchbase and also within the broader market. And no, no SQL doesn't always mean abandoning the query language itself. So I'll just get that out, out front. We're going to burn through about four different sections of information. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking just specifically about Couchbase. So if you're turned off from hearing too much vendor, vendor pitch at the beginning, don't worry. It's, uh, it's light and should be uh, fairly digestible. But uh, I also will just kind of compare and contrast uh, how Couchbase fits into the needs of, kind of modern architecture that we have for developing engaging applications. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can get into get into the NoSQL space and give you some good resources to link to at the end that uh, will help you kind of assess your own situation and plan your next steps forward. So let's get some of the, the biggest assumptions out of the way right now, or the, maybe depending on where you're at in your application development kind of uh, uh, life path, <laughs> you'll know already that the interactions that customers are having with applications is, is a lot more than the, the interactions are a lot higher in number than the transactions themselves. So if you think about how a typical end user interacts with an application, say let's say like a web application where they have to click on a link, uh, liking a tweet, starting a game, entering a search term, uh, everything from playing a video, adjusting volume, all these little interactions are uh, uh, quite numerous. Um, and then hopefully at the end of all of it, it leads to uh, a transaction, uh, making an online payment, for example. And that's really might, might be what you're really looking for. So that kind of idea of building this, this big volume of interactions and supporting that kind of interaction in a meaningful, engaging way is really what we're talking about when we're talking about moving beyond relational. Uh, because typical traditional relational approach was we need to track some transactions and that's what we're interested in doing but there's this whole other realm of interactions with customer base and user base i should say that uh, isn't been capturing being being captured very well over the last while 
And needless to say, these are just a few of the uh, expectations that customers have now. They want personalized and responsive experiences, and that's really not just expected but demanded. You build an app that's slightly less personalized than your competitor, and you're out of the running in a lot of cases. Um, you know, these look like more like consumer examples here, but really we're talking about users within your own organization that you're building your applications for too, not just consumers. So behind these requirements is the need for a real flexible architecture. Uh, the users or customers in this, in this example are really demanding, They're, they have dynamic needs, unpredictable in many ways, and it's really not the same requirements that we've had in the past. Um, and we'll get more into it, but use cases for specific apps can change and, and pivot and grow extremely dramatically and very quickly uh, bigger than you expected them to be. So we'll, we'll come, come more to how we deal with handling that in the NoSQL world. And I should say application developers often know that this level, but the database owners have a different perspective and are just trying to be stable, transaction uh, transactional database, but the um, merging of both the application flexibility and the database flexibility is really what we're talking about today as well. They both have to work together to produce these experiences that the users demand. So historically, we've had two kind of approaches, the transactional database, and then when we eclipsed the capabilities of real-time transactional analysis, we have the analytical database, and that was kind of the, the two broad buckets of databases that we've had. And failure in those two categories was when we try to push them too far to the, to the edge and try to get them to do more other things than, the, than they are architected for. <clears throat> and then so we end up with this scenario where we have these additional uh, solutions that are required, but they don't really fit firmly into either of those buckets. Um, you might take a transactional database and put the data into a cache and uh, make that available to a web app, or you might um, put it into a search engine, a search system, and make that available to your web app, or um, et cetera. So, so there's a bunch of different little solutions that kind of have hang out there, but these are really the meat and potatoes of what where the user interaction is. So many, many databases have attempted to add these new functionality through just adding little components or uh, bolt-ons on the side of their core database product. Um, but it's really sacrificing the manageability of their database and still not solving the agility problem. So we've come at it from a slightly different angle and said, okay, let's, let's look at the end user and the kinds of engagements they need to have with the data that we have, uh, um, that we're collecting from them. And we've come to this idea of an engagement database. And really, if it, it's really, you can think of it more as an integrated data platform that serves those kind of customer needs in a more flexible way and reduces complexity of the overall architecture. So if we went back to that previous slide and where there's all the little dots, we can roll up the, that, those requirements into a, a new type of database that serves those needs best without sacrificing kind of manageability and agility and performance and complexity. So we'll, we'll deal with each of those today. So these are what we call our attributes of an engagement database. It's really what, what kinds of features are you going to need in the solutions you're building? Um, these, it's interesting when you read through these, it sounds like common sense, but Really, we are still pushing the envelope on several fronts with, with several of these items. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, applications, so the front end that interacts with the user, applications are tied tightly to their underlying databases. And then those underlying databases are tied tightly to, like for example, the cloud example here, they're tied to their mode of deployment and, and they'll be limited by their ability to scale so the higher level applications will suffer if, if all of these kinds of attributes are not addressed in the solution that you're building on top of. 
So uh, it may not be obvious even now if you're a smaller shop and you're building your own applications that are that you're going to uh, maybe it's a mobile solution and you have high availability requirements and you're deploying on cloud you might think you've got it set if you solve those three but then you launch and you exceed your expectations thank goodness and you have to scale and you have changes to your um, platform or to your product um, you you'll grow and you'll eventually hit every one of these issues and by built-in smarts too we think of things like manageability um, uh, management consoles other additional features and things like that the other ones i think here are all fairly obvious i won't go through each of them any in any more detail than that except to say there are specific attributes of an engagement database that are not what you would traditionally say uh, is is the purview of a relational database although we try to deal with a lot of these problems uh, wherever they come up. This is a, um, my only kind of overview slide of, of our product in terms of our, our data platform. And you'll see front and center, and this kind of the center of all of this is the red, the red items that, that present the core expectations of, for scalable systems, that there's persistence layer, but there's memory first architecture. So it's not just an in-memory database that doesn't have a persistence layer, but no, we do, we do store it and we do save it. And we do replicate it and we have uh, high availability capabilities, but that whole memory first persistence and elastic scalability is really important core, core function. But then we also have replication capability and I'll talk about that in a bit, but on top of all of that kind of core capability, like, then we have uh, the ways to access the data through different services, whether it's through querying or through um, uh, SDKs or through uh, full text search, for example. Those capabilities are all serviced by the same core. And really that's the differentiator compared to typical relational systems is that that's not their core. That's not what they're trying to solve, a memory first scalability, persistence, replication problem. Um, but that's what we set out to solve out of the gate. And then you have the kind of the gray wrapper around all of this that makes it easy to use, having a, a common SDK, for example, and common security protocols, and then also integrating with other big data and SQL products. So there's a lot going on, but at different levels um, built around this really solid core. <clears throat> so why are we even talking about moving beyond relational databases at this point? Here are four of the biggest items that we've identified as really these are the, this is the reality that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis with their traditional databases and how it really um, hurts and holds back their ability to grow or to develop new applications. And now we sh and just uh, on that note, we we do see customers who do start to move, say, greenfield, new new applications they're building, move put them onto a new platform, um, while they still keep their older older systems running on a traditional database. So it's not it's not like uh, we're advocating you know rip and replace. But I will come back to a few scenarios of reference architectures for you. And I'm sure one of the, the four I'll present are going to touch on something that relates to the applications you're building. But we all, we all understand the challenges around rigid schemas. Um, as an application developer, you know you need to change your, say, a front-end form on some uh, application. You need it to be reflected in the database. You also have to change maybe your middle layer, um, middleware layer to change the query that's being sent back and forth. Um, there's that rigidity of schemas can cost a lot of money for companies, even though they know they need to change the schema, they kind of go, um, is it really worth it? It's going to be expensive. Let's hold that off until a later time. Um, and that's one of the challenges for sure. Performance is a big one. We love to talk about performance because we have a really good story around that. Um, as you know from that previous slide, those core red capabilities in the center of our product also um, play really well to performance as well as scalability advantages that we, we need to focus on. So and everybody wants those things. They want their application to be able to scale. They want their database to be able to scale. And as they have a thousand more users, they don't want to have to add a thousand more servers. Um, and that brings us to the cost 
uh, item as well. So a lot of traditional databases are expensive, not just uh, from a licensing perspective, but from a growth perspective. So when you do try to scale up to manage bigger workloads, the cost will go up. Um, uh, and you often have to overcompensate and buy more capabilities than you really need. And so we're kind of look at relational database limitations from three different perspectives, agility, performance, and manageability. And from the traditional database vendor side, we have, well, I put access through all three of these because these are the, the highest and easiest points for us to address. Um, as, a, as a vendor who has specifically targeted these um, limitations and made sure that they're not a limitation for our product, I wanted to walk through, first of all, why it's a limitation, then uh, an example of how we deal with it or how we recommend you deal with it, um, no matter what pl platform you go, go with in the end. So the first one is they, that, that things don't, the relational databases don't handle change well. And we've got a little picture here showing, oh, there's a, the first iteration of our schema looks good, but the second iteration, we want to change something. We want to add on uh, Twitter uh, user ID instead of just having a first name and last name. And that costs money to do, and it's a challenge, and it's not easy to implement those changes. So, but we, we also know that applications are always changing, and you identify one weakness, you identify a market opportunity, you adjust and you adapt. Um, you shouldn't have to actually go back and re-engineer your database technology to be able to handle that, um, especially when time is tight and uh, quite potentially very costly. So that's a the agility, uh, schema agility problem. So the way that we've dealt with it and the way that other vendors do, do as well, to be fair, is to adopt JSON data as its kind of a JSON data structure as its kind of primary doc type of document that's stored in the database. So instead of tables and columns and rows, instead we have a JSON document with keys and values, and those are um, adjustable and you can add to them, you can update them at any level, whether it's a high level, change the whole document, replace it, or replace a piece of it, or replace one word, or update a counter, et cetera. The data manipulation can be very simplified. The, um, we, we know how to update strings. We know how to update arrays. We know how to <laughs> update those things. So from a developer's angle, it's actually not uh, complex to really get your head around. But you're not having to change how you're accessing um, the schema, for example. So we say that much less code is required, and because there's less code required to access and, and interact with these things, we, we believe that you have a uh, more bug-free experience. Um, and JSON is already part of uh, a majority of the workflows that are going on, especially all the ones on the web, pretty much. The other limitation that we deal with that you need to evaluate your application on is around performance and scalability is the big question here and you can see the graphic on the left there's the big database at the bottom there's many little application servers on the in the middle and then there's the end user applications at the top and the um, to continue to make this perform let's say you're going to add more application servers and you're going to need a bigger database uh, set of database hardware, for example. And we we find that the typical experience of our customer is that as they scale up and have bigger and bigger machines for servicing that database, eventually the uh, return on investment becomes negative and you can only scale to a certain point. And often that means going back and saying, okay, now we need to re reevaluate all of our machines and have something that's more uh, powerful out of the gate that we can then scale up to. Um, but this this leads a lot of customers to saying, okay, now I'm going to upgrade my servers uh, more than I need to right now in the anticipation I might need to later, but it's such a pain I don't want to later. So your provision beyond peak capacity. And then there's just challenges around running these kinds of scale-up environments on cloud platform the uh, cloud providers will only provide certain machine types anyway. So you'll kind of hit this uh, hit this end of uh, where, where you can't scale beyond a certain point. 
So that's that's a challenge. And often we know that the hardware costs are so high and you have to get extra special machines to do your to, to keep the business running that it's a real, real problem for people. So we come at it slightly differently. We have a database tier that's that itself is scalable and can be is clustered replicated environment. So because the data is distributed, we can actually distribute our web server servers can actually access the data on those specific nodes that they need to access it from. So there's a I'll, I'll touch on that I think a little bit later, but the the efficiencies there are that you can add new uh, new servers, scale out, add new nodes uh, without having to buy extra beefy machines all the time, getting better and better and better. And we have linear scalability. I should uh, jump ahead on my points here. We have linear scalability on that front, so you can add more and and more nodes and have your application performance continue along at the same rate or even improve. We also have capabilities that allow us to scale up out your environment without actually disrupting the database uh, uh, the database performance itself. So you add a new node to it. It takes there's a, actually it's a, literally a but a push button experience. Type in an IP address of your new node, uh, say rebalance your system, and it will systematically go through and redistribute or replace nodes that have failed and redistribute the data across the, the new set of nodes that's available. So that's the kind of experience that we expect, especially when we're talking about um, not affecting performance just um, when you want to scale out further. We want the performance to be maintained. Uh, sharding, again, I realize I'm probably running a little slow on my slides here, so I'll try to skip through this a bit. But sharding can be a massive headache, especially when you're scaling up. Uh, and the uh, the additional overhead of managing shards across multiple nodes or multiple databases in a traditional relational or relational database is a, is a real pain, and we hear it from our customers all the time. Um, Couchbase, we have an auto sharding capability by design that your data is automatically redistributed across nodes. You don't need to, as a DBA, for example, need to know where your data is going or where it's sitting. The applications will actually get that information directly from the cluster itself and know where to field their requests to for optimal performance across these shards. So with replication being a first class citizen in our database, it's built in and it makes it a lot easier to scale and keep your costs and management challenges down. So that's those are the main weaknesses um, that we've been engineering and architecting our system to solve. I'll just go back to the summary slide there, the agility and flexibility, performance at any scale, and simple management. Um, in, a, in another webinar sometime, or maybe you can look up one of our videos from our Couchbase Connect events, you can see in action, and it's actually quite impressive, especially our cloud orchestration capabilities, when we turn on elastic scalability um, and see how a database can grow and shrink based on demand uh, just by the push of a few buttons. It's pretty pretty impressive. So how do we get uh, beyond those relational challenges that we looked at? Well, I've talked a little bit about our platform and how it solves some of those problems. Um, you can look at how uh, the first step uh, is really reevaluating how you're managing your data and what your data, the most atomic pieces of your data look like. And the JSON schema approach is so flexible that we've actually listed four different ways of storing your data. And what I really wanted to call out here is you can change a piece of your data, one value of your data, of one, of one um, key, or the whole document. Um, you can have a normalized or a denormalized uh, scenario. Either one will work. And if you're looking, for example, talking about a user profile, you might want all that user profile data in one document, not split out across multiple tables. So you would say, give me that whole document and your application can 
uh, I just snapped my fingers there, your application can have it uh, all in one request. Um, otherwise, if you do um, break it up into multiple tables with references between those tables, then you'll need some kind of a multiple requests or a query, as I'll show you in a second, to pull all that information together. So in a relational database, you might have multiple tables to represent your data. In the JSON, you can have multiple or you don't have multiple. It's, it's your choice. Instead of the database forcing you into one paradigm, you can make that decision based on the data that you have at hand. And you can do relationships in Couchbase. They're different than in a relational database. It's not uh, primary boring key kind of concepts, but instead it's going to be programmatically accessing referenced data. And we'll talk about one way we do that right now. Oh, sorry. I meant to add accessing data is the other side of the equation. We have storing data using flexible JSON approach. Accessing data in multiple ways is important too. You can do a direct call to get a document. You can do a direct call to get a specific value from that document. We can do SQL-based querying. I'll show you on the next slide. You could do a full text search. We also have an analytics query that's built on SQL++ that allows you to do, to do more aggregates and, and more performant group buys and things like that. And then, uh, and that's the call out to the MPP for large ad hoc query access. So we, we don't want to just store the data and then have one way to get it back out. We have multiple ways to store it, multiple ways to get it back out. The permutations are endless uh, and really address the most common enterprise requests for data handling that you can you can guess what they all are like based on your own needs. So here's one of our approaches to data access. One is uh, our, our query language called Nickel, NoSQL query language or SQL for JSON. I hope that yellow text shows up okay for you, but you'll recognize the, for the relational users in the room, you'll recognize the insert into statement. Uh, you'll recognize the green select from statements. And again, um, there's no magic in any of these. I better turn on my highlighter here, just a sec. Uh, there's no magic in these little colons and stuff. These are just names of a document. And the, uh, these, these are names of uh, keys within the document, or field names within the document you could think of it as. So there's, uh, it's, it's a simple JSON data structure, but you can reference field names like you would normally in a normal SQL environment. And has uh, almost all of the, SQL capabilities you're used to having, really. Um, for example, we can do joins. So if you choose to have your documents separated into multiple components, you can do joins. And there's a, a, secure, a, a SQL or a nickel example at the bottom here of just joining based on uh, uh, key name. In this case, the uh, common key is used as the uh, as the join parameter, but we also have actually just implemented also full ANSI joins, so you can do your where clauses to join all the documents together. So if you think of it as a bucket full of documents, and that's what we call them buckets, then you've got multiple documents you want to pull together. You can actually do that through simple query uh, uh, capabilities that you're used to using in a relational environment. So it's pretty exciting, as, but it was for me moving from a SQL and analytics platform into NoSQL and realizing I can still write my queries without having to write code or writing some obscure proprietary um, kind of query language. Instead, you, you, your SQL developers can start to work with, uh, with Couchbase NoSQL environment without really having to change too much of their capabilities. And then full text search is one of the other ways that we're exposing that data that's stored in the highly distributed, scalable environment. Um, I won't really go too much into full text search. It was a product I worked on uh, extensively, so I could talk about it for an hour. But the idea that your data, that's maybe you start as having cached data and you want to expose that data through a web search capability. Well, we have web, web uh, I should say we have search capabilities built in as a service, around, again, around that core functionality. And you can index your data without really having to do very much work and build an application that calls that data. We have a um, uh, scoring algorithms built in and we have the ability to um, give you kind of the snippet of the, where the data is stored within that field and give you some context. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty fun project actually to use. 
I'd like to switch gears a little bit here now and step back. I've talked a little bit about our capabilities, how we're addressing some of those common questions around how do I how do I still query data, for example. And now we're going to move to what what would it look like if I was to get started uh, with Couchbase and one of the recommendations or four of the recommendations that we have for how to picture this in your mind. So a lot of people come from using a product like Memcached or other caching solutions. Uh, for Memcached, actually, uh, was several of the engineers that started Couchbase are from the, were from that project team. So we know it well, and we actually are a drop-in replacement for it if you are using that technology already. But uh, Couchbase can be used as a caching layer on top of your relational database. So you've got your typical relational database there. Um, you don't necessarily need to rip and replace that. Instead, why don't you push the data into Couchbase and let us service the request through this highly scalable environment, uh, highly performant, and to feed your application layer uh, in, a, in, a, in a more performant way. And because our databases can run on really on um, commodity hardware, you can scale that out to your heart's content um, and hopefully manage your costs a bit better than you were having to scale up bigger and bigger servers all the time. But this is a really typical kind of first step into learning more about Couchbase is to start caching some of your database requests through Couchbase. So your tabular data can get stored as documents in Couchbase. People can write SQL queries or our nickel language queries against those documents still, so your app can still use uh, SQL concepts if desired, or you can start to just do direct document fetches and serve those back up to your end users. This is where it gets really exciting for me, is this idea of replicating data geographically. So we all know that we, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't all have one database. And if you do replicate your data to another database, you don't want it necessarily stored in the same data center. Or similarly, you have application users who are in different geographic areas, and they want the data, a copy of the data, close at hand, so they have optimal performance as well. Well, one of the, aside from that core capabilities, built into Couchbase, the other kind of core architectural advantage is really this replication capability. And we call it cross data center replication or XDCR. And it, we can, you could have so many different replication models. This one here is just showing um, basically um, because we have a multi-master environment, you can keep multiple databases in multiple locations all synchronized with each other and using our uh, conflict resolution that's built in and everything, you can always make sure that you have the most latest document stored in all those databases. This is really worth looking into. It's a real game changer um, and it's a differentiating feature for our product. You won't find the strong capabilities anywhere else. Um, but that said, once you move to maybe not, maybe you had a cache and maybe now you have a distributed cache that's geographically distributed as well and accessible to all your application um, uh, servers around the world. I mean, then it gets a little more complex when we start about talking about how to like aggregate data from multiple sources. So the red stuff in here is all Couchbase. And we might have, for example, the Couchbase globally distributed replicated environment at the bottom right. And it services the applications uh, that, are, that are needed. But behind the scenes, there might be a lot more going on. For example, if you're already using messaging systems, uh, event buses, or uh, Spark for analytics and ingest, and you're pulling data from whatever other data sources, it could be from other Couchbase databases for that matter, owned by a different group within your own company. We push all those things into an event bus or even directly into something like Spark, and we can connect with those and have the data actually synchronized uh, with Couchbase with the clusters themselves. Uh, then you could also push that data out and store it in another, uh, ex other external data stores. Maybe you're going to throw it into your data lake, or you're going to create another Couchbase database that's with aggregated or 
pre-computed or maybe you're running some machine learning algorithms in Spark and you're saving the results out into a relational database or into Couchbase. So there's, this is really more common when people get really into using Couchbase and having to develop full featured applications, especially when you talk about machine learning and data analytics and things like that. Not everybody wants to use our, our platform for everything. And um, this allows us to augment our capabilities with integration with products like Kafka and Spark. And then the final reference architecture here is really how to create mobile applications that are as resilient as the Couchbase typical applications are. So we have the Couchbase server at the top. Um, we have a product I haven't talked about. It's called Sync Gateway. It's part of our mobile platform. We have Couchbase Lite which is a database that runs on uh, embedded architectures. And we can synchronize that data back to the Couchbase server. Now, there's other things we can do with Sync Gateway. I won't go into detail on it. It's not my strong point anyway. But you have web apps that are working with the Couchbase server. You can have web apps that are working with the Sync Gateway. And you can have mobile apps that are all keeping synchronized with all of the data in the stack. It looks more disconnected than it really is. These are all fairly well integrated products. Um, but you can also have other external databases feeding data in and changing information, listening for changes really from your mobile application. Um, I should say Couchbase Lite also has peer-to-peer uh, -peer replication and offline capabilities. So you could, if you got five handhelds and they're programmed to work together, uh, they can go offline uh, from the main database, keep each other updated, and then synchronize when you connect again. There's some really kind of architectural challenges we've overcome with this architecture here. I'd like to walk through a few use cases, but kind of before I dive into, into say, specific industry use cases or customer examples, I wanted to lay a little bit about the landscape that we fit into because you might be wondering, well, how is this going to work with my BI tool or how is this going to work with my uh, talent ETL processes, et cetera? And maybe just if we can start at the bottom of this diagram talking about data sources, we obviously, we all have different data sources, it's whether it's social media data, sensor data, or other databases from mobile apps, et cetera, or in the case of many of our customers, mainframe, and they want to pull that data out and integrate it with something else. So we move up the up to the next level of the layers here. And we have like Kafka and Spark, like we already talked about, helping digest that data and push it into Couchbase. Uh, we have Talent doing ETL operations, and maybe you're using Spark or even MapReduce to do more kind of processing of that data and then spitting that out into Couchbase. Now, I should say um, with the data lake and data warehouse here, we're not replacing those and not really even competing with those. Those are different use cases altogether, but we might ingest data from there or save data to them depending on, on your use case. But our, real, our, our, our focus is really on the real-time data ingest from these other platforms. And then that's our core data serving capabilities, and then we can put it into an in-memory cache and service your BI tools and dashboards and query tools. We have our own integrated query workbench, so you can just access it through a web UI and get up and running, running queries right away, actually. After this call, it would take you five minutes to download the software, uh, two minutes to install it probably, and you can uh, load one of our sample data sets and start running queries. It's that easy. But we have other tie-ins to other products as well as uh, uh, Tableau and Noe and other BI tools. So that's that's how it kind of fits in there. Um, I think that's probably enough said on that slide. But not only are we integrating with many different products, but we're also having to address the needs of multiple different industries. So if you think of, you know, we don't sell a database just for gaming or a database just for financial services. Um, if we go back to what a lot of those engagement database requirements were, they, all of these industries have those requirements. So we have to be able to service those requirements, meet those demands, and um, provide the data in a meaningful, performant, agile way. And we do that for 
many different kinds of applications, not just certain industries, but each of those industries also has several of these use cases going on. And this is really, again, it's a data platform that services these kinds of different use cases. It's not just, just a database for session data or a database for product catalog. Really, customers are building these different endpoints on top of Couchbase to service multiple types of applications and, and use cases for each customer. And, you know, really, if you step back and you look at this diagram or at this layout here, and you think that the traditional relational database wasn't designed for a lot of these challenges um, from its outset. Um, and these are actually, these are these cases that we've been designed for um, from day from day one, really, and continue to be targeting these kinds of use cases for our customers. Now, there's obviously a lot more we could talk about going through each of these use cases, but I, I do want to have some time for questions at the end here. So I'll burn through that and we can come back to talking about some of them. But if you do think about things like um, customer 360, you're fusing a bunch of data sources, ingesting from uh, aggregating data sources from multiple places, um, and you'll surface that information to an application that needs that kind of unified view of everything. Well, that's a, a very different database approach than a traditional relational approach would be, where um, maybe a product catalog as well. You want to, we're in a, in a new age now where we want to serve up as much of our kind of internal data as possible to educate that customer as fast as possible so they'll make that transaction happen. Well, now we're, we're actually servicing up documents and imagery and other items that are all part of a catalog capability. Now, it's, it's a different, entirely different use case than we used to think about. Uh, I won't talk through too many of these customer examples, but you can see we've got a range of uh, media providers that are our customers who are running session databases. And we've got a range of travel related, travel and hospitality management, managing their inventory and what assets they have in the field, um, down to managing um, uh, product catalogs of what to buy at the store. So we have a broad range, and I believe it's 20 of the 20 of the uh, uh, top 200 companies that we actually are, have as customers. And a couple examples I thought you might appreciate seeing how LinkedIn, with their 450 million plus members, I didn't realize it was that big, that's uh, amazing, and with their billions of hits per day, um, they needed uh, faster read time, but their traditional uh, uh, relational database just wasn't working for them. And even their caching layer, MemcacheD in this case was causing reliability challenges and manageability challenges. Really, was they really neither of these platforms were developed with these kinds of both performance throughput and uh, scalability demands that they had. Now, who who would have expected that they needed to service 450 million members 10 years ago? It would have been uh, a bit of a joke at the time. But they were able to get their latency down. They were able to get their query performance up, and they were able to reduce their costs by switching to Couchbase. These slides will be in your, in your handout that you'll get after as well. FICO, uh, looking for fraud detection. You might appreciate their work, even if you don't know what they're doing in the back end. Um, the, they needed to have higher throughput. Is important, and especially you can consider these fraud detection scenarios, right? They have to analyze things fast. They have to react quick. <laughs> they have to hand it off to, for example, in this case, their neural networking algorithms to, to compute stuff and get that information back in a timely manner. And they can never go down. They always have to be up or it's a huge problem. So we were able to help them with that example. And one more customer use case for you here. Again, moving from a relational database they had a lot of cost challenges at eBay to support their 18 million sellers that they have. They had performance issues. Um, and again, it's a key architectural challenge that they had around performance. Um, they, it was really something you can't fix unless you're designing for it. They were able to increase their performance and also increase their availability by, by adopting Couchbase. So the 
scalability questions and performance questions were obviously very fundamental for them. So I uh, just got a couple slides left here really for your reference. This is um, our data platform. I'll turn off my pointer. This is our data platform and the core kind of capabilities that we bring to the market. There, we're continuing to grow. We also have full text search capabilities and um, MPP analytics capabilities as well now that we just released last week. So we'll be updating these slides. But mobile, multi-dimensional, multi-master. We don't have, there's no limitations. You can uh, read and write from any of those servers that you're replicating to. Our competition can't claim that. And we have a full SQL query language that makes it easy to get involved quickly. So there's some, some really game-changing capabilities there. And when you start to look into our cloud native platform or hybrid cloud platform options, it's really exciting stuff as well. I wanted to leave you with a few next steps of things to do. Um, for example, you can obviously, obviously go to our website and learn more. Um, I've put some links in here that you can access uh, in the PDF. Uh, two white papers that would be uh, specifically interesting to you following this talk. We'll dive, we can dive into the architecture. We can talk more about how we compare to other relational databases. And we have our performance benchmarking, which you find probably find really interesting. That's an easy URL to write there. So I put it there for you. If you just go to couchbase.com slash benchmarks, you can get access to those reports uh, right away. It's um, really detailed sets of queries and stuff is all spelled out in those reports. We have free online training. We have um, in-person training capabilities as well. If that's what you need to train a large group up, get up uh, and going really quick, we can train large groups of people within your organization easily. And then just to encourage you to go and download our 6.0 production release that just came out uh, seven days ago. Give it a try, and I'd love to hear feedback. You can send us just general information to info at couchbase.com or email it to me, and I'm sorry I didn't put my address on here, but it's just Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, at couchbase.com. I'd love to hear more from you. So thanks for um, sticking around this long, and I look forward to any questions that I might be able to answer in the next uh, few minutes. Shannon, are you fielding those questions for me? I am, yeah. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording. And I, cool. Yeah. So, um, and everyone's being very quiet right now. I yeah. think well, I I'd love to hear... Guys, I don't know if, if if we need to encourage them to write more. Um, I'd love to hear you know other people who have made this switch or made this move for an application to move from one environment to another. Um, give me a plus one or something in the comments so that we know that you've gone through this transition or if you're just kind of contemplating doing it. I'd love to hear about the challenge that you're or concern what's keeping you up at night um, considering that that change. Everyone's. Oh, everyone's so quiet today. So unlike our community, I know y'all are just very active and engaged. So <laughs> I know somebody's got some. Well, it's an fine. unusual day. It's election day. Everyone's oh, to get back to the election. <laughs> everyone's watching the news. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. We got some <laughs> some questions coming in. So I appreciate this. Um, but so, what of, sort of lead times would you expect moving to Couchbase? Well, it's going to obviously depend on your requirements and um, the data volumes and complexity that you expect. But from a developer angle, you can get up starting really, really fast just on your local machines very easily. And we have really tried to engineer it so that the getting up and running with the software is like the easy part. The other part is developing on it. And we've got you know a single a single uh, SDK that you could use with, for seven different programming languages. So if you're proficient in one of those, which you will be, and your hardware is already ready to go, then you, you really have a very short 
time to get moving. Um, really, the goal is that we get you up and running uh, and the software and we step out of the way and the rest will be up to how, how fast you can develop on it. So I know there's not a real kind of single answer to the question, unfortunately. Um, how how long? But um, and I don't. I I should probably see if I can get those statistics for those three use cases and, and see if I uh, I can make a comment about how fast they were able to move over. But when I mean, you're talking about eBay and LinkedIn, I mean, they're so huge anyway that it probably took them months before they had uh, really moved stuff over or set things up enough or architected their solution from from a developer angle first. So. Uh, give yourself give yourself a few months, and I think you you'll probably be pretty happy. And, you know, pick a use case that's small enough and easy. Maybe a new project that doesn't require a whole bunch of reworking of existing applications or a database. And that would be the way that I would approach it. I I like to do the baby steps approach. Find something small, have some success, and then maybe try scaling it up and adding and uh, doubling your cluster size, for example. But from an architectural side, if you need one cluster or you need a, a cluster with one node for development and testing your own idea out, that's easy. You can install this on your MacBook uh, by the time we're done this webinar. And uh, if you want to scale it up to three nodes uh, or 10 nodes, and you just want a few nodes that are doing querying capabilities and a few nodes that are doing data storage, then uh, you can do that as well. You can actually customize all of those capabilities and spread it out the way you want amongst your cluster. So, And there's a lot of plus ones coming in here, um, Tyler, with statements of um, people looking to go from SQL to or, or relational to, uh, to non-relational, um, some high volume um, SQL server uses out there that they're looking to convert. Um, so what's to awesome. be done? Yeah, uh, transfer from traditional databases to cache based. Is there what are some of the quick and easy steps that you haven't maybe covered already? Um, there's a there's a couple of different scenarios I can think of off the top of my head. And in, in one is if if you already have like an ETL framework going on where you're aggregating data from multiple sources, look at using a product like Talend to run your ETL process and start putting that data into Couchbase, and then have your developers start to maybe take an existing application and instead of querying the relational database, they're doing a nickel or a, in this case, a SQL like query directly to Couchbase. And that's kind of the two components, moving the data and then building and rewriting the applications or writing new applications that access it. Um, it really is that simple. There isn't a whole bunch that you have to learn about how to manage the system itself. So we've tried to make that uh, the, the least uh, barrier as possible. <laughs> um, uh, you can clarify the question if there's more you'd like to know about. That's pretty much that my my summary anyway. Again, baby steps approach. Get some data in. Get some real data in. Start developing against it, and go to a, check out our developer docs. And actually, our online training has developer training in it. Um, it's not just how to use the product. It's how to build on top of the product. How to write a full web app on the product. How to write uh, full text search capabilities on the product. So you can get up and running really fast. And I love all these questions coming in. I knew you all weren't shy and had some questions. Um, so how many <laughs> corporate customers in the U.S. are currently using Couchbase? Do you know? Um, in the U.S., I don't know, but uh, I do have this uh, slide summary, summarizing statistics. Let me pull it back up. Uh, yes, this one. Yeah, so we have 500-plus enterprise customers. Um, including 20 plus Fortune 100 customers. So, we, and we have a community edition that's that's uh, f free to use as well. So, we have a lot of usage in the market that we're probably even not aware of <laughs> because of the open source model. But we also uh, really focus on some of the larger enterprise needs. Obviously, that they drive the hardest challenges to us. Um, smaller companies don't have as many of those scalability challenges as the big folks do. But uh, obviously, anyone of any company of any size benefits from from our model here. 
And there's a question here. And can you provide simple documentation following the development on Couchbase? And uh, maybe Tanya, uh, if you can get that to me, I can get that out to uh, everybody in the follow-up email. Yeah, I really recommend the training. Uh, the training includes all the material that you'll need. Um, has video tutorials, has code examples, has actually has quizzes and things as well. So you can know you're really getting trained on uh, on the the, the the patterns that you need for developing in, on Couchbase. Um, but there is documentation as well at docs.couchbase.com, and you can start diving in if you want to see those examples. There's some getting started examples in there that pop up right away. So what is the strongest Couch SDK in terms of heavy I.O. or large payload scenarios? Node.js, Java, .NET? Well, I certainly, those are our, our, our three largest ones right there, uh, Node, Java, and uh, the .NET. So I would say you go with whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, I can't speak to kind of throughput and, and uh, heavy lifting like that. But join our forums and uh, at forums.couchbase.com, and you can actually interact with the engineers themselves directly if you wanted to kind of dig in a bit more there. Um, but I think any 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 of those top three are going to be uh, uh, hands down easy easy for you to to get the performance you're interested in. So, what is the max data volume Couchbase can handle? We don't actually have a max data volume limit. We don't have a max node limit either. I know some of our competitors have have limitations um, in their caching products. Um, so our we we can can scale up and we can scale out um, as needed. Uh, we have a documentation limit of 25 megabytes per document. So in the tabular world, right, that'd be the 25 megabytes per record. Um, uh, so if you're making that shift over in kind of terms of philosophy, keep that in mind. But uh, other than that, we don't actually have any hard limits uh, that we're aware of. Our customers let us know when they hit performance challenging limits and they need to scale up, but it's usually not due to data volume, but due to say processing and indexing, keeping up with um, the, the amount of changes that they have going on. Those are more of the challenges um, and not so much the data. Uh, volume question. Um, I should say too, like our pricing model is per node. So it's different than some of our competition in the relational world too that likes to charge per CPU. So I think you'll find that you can scale up your machines and keep scaling them up. Um, in our model, you, you won't actually pay more. Um, but as you scale out, then, you, then your license needs to expand to include those new nodes. That's great. And I think we've got time for a couple other questions here. Um, does Couchbase work with all apps or is there any limit? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what uh, all apps? Correct. All apps, all apps. Well, we have integrations with, um, yeah, there's probably some specific apps the person has in mind, but the the approach we've taken is our SDKs Obviously, anything that's available to those programming languages elsewhere, we can you can leverage in your application to use with, with Couchbase. So if, for example, there's a machine learning capability that you want to integrate with, but it's only available in Spark, well, we integrate with Spark so that you can then go and use all those advanced capabilities of another platform that's kind of focused on that capability. Um, so we really, uh, we have integrations with with ODBC and JDBC, I mean, that kind of almost goes without saying. And then we have integrations with all of the, the main programming languages. So there shouldn't be any limitations there. And then we have specific integrations with um, some uh, with Tableau and Noe on the BI side. And then we have specific integrations with Talent and others. And then the community builds their own integrations with even more. So we, they're being, because we're based on open source and all of our SDKs are open source, you can actually con continue to do more integration if you feel that that's needed. Um, but of course, someone will have a, an application that we don't plug into directly, or maybe we plug in through JDBC and it's not as optimal performance as they would expect. Um, there's, there's, room, there's still room there for more integrations with other products. But uh, we've we've tried to take a, a broad enough approach that 
people can build what they need if we don't have it, but also to support what we believe that the core market needs. And so Kafka and Spark fill a lot of those gaps um, from the big data side, for example. Well, Tyler, that does bring us to the top of the hour. Thanks for another great presentation. You're welcome. For this balance leadership from Couchbase. We just love it. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Thanks for jumping in on the questions there. That was just yeah. fabulous. Um, and just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording, and, uh, and we'll get that additional information requested throughout, um, to, as, to you all as well. Sounds good. Again, Tyler, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Have a great day. See you later. Bye.